This podcast is brought to you by Kiwi Design, the leader in MetaQuest and VR accessories. And now you can deck out your device while supporting the podcast. The MetaQuest 2 is a great headset, but do you ever feel things could be a bit more comfortable? Well, we have the solution for you with lens protectors, controller grips, face covers, head straps, link cables, headset stands, and more, including my two personal favorites, the top version controller grips with added weight and an extended handle, and the Kiwi upgraded elite strap. Let's be real, we've all whacked our controller. Don't be the guy messaging Oculus support for your own mistake or waiting weeks for an out-of-stock controller. Visit the link in our show notes to prepare yourself today. After visiting the link in our show notes, Make sure to use the promo code ROUGHTALKVR at checkout, all one word, to take full advantage of your savings. And make sure to click the link in our show notes so the podcast gets credit and you help support us. Remember, whatever you need, Kiwi has you covered. Hey, welcome to this episode of Rough Talk VR. Today we have another interview that I'm so excited for. I've, been, I've honestly been waiting a while for this one. And one could say logistics or time or whatever, you know. It's taken longer than it probably should have. So I am excited that we've got this gentleman on. Oh, yeah. Today we're joined with Michael Wentworth Bell of Digital Load, the developers of Aspire 1 and 2. And we've been having a blast with Aspire 2. You know, we haven't reviewed it yet, but even last night we fired it back up, mm-hmm. laughed probably. Down, yeah, and we were going to ask about this, which we'll get to is do most people laugh as much as we do playing, you know, co op? Yeah, we're, we're terrible agents because we definitely take our sweet ass time. Just cost a fortune to run us. Yeah, but hey, but, we're, we <laughs> get the job done. We get the job done. So, uh, but, you know, we always also joke that we're selfish. You know, we record on weekends. And in this case, we have somebody who it's kind of the next day in the morning, waking up fresh and early uh, to be with us. So definitely we appreciate this one. But before we start talking your ear off, uh, Michael, do you mind to introduce yourself a little bit? To the dev- or to our listeners, and also tell them a little bit about your games. You know, Aspire One and Two. Yeah, totally. Uh, g'day, everyone who's listening and watching. P- really appreciate the chance to be on the show, guys. Um, personally, a massive fan. Um, love the reviews and interviews. But, but yeah, my name is Michael Wentworth Bell. I'm the founder and creative director of Digital Load, and so our games, our company, really was founded on the question of like why isn't there a Metal Gear Solid in VR back in 2016 and so our games have shamelessly tried to kind of you know reimagine those stealth mechanics in in VR much smaller team size and and budgets Um, our first game was kind of Goldeneye meets Metal Gear and our sequel is much more stealth focused but that's a short summary of them Aspire 1 and Aspire 2. So I'll take a big Metal Gear Solid fan uh, you know, in your yeah. flat screen game. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. I have a, I have a friend that that's like his all time. Dude, the first, series. the first one ever that came out was, it was like, to me, the most game changing experience I ever had mm-hmm. in on flat screen. I was like, this is absolutely so far off from what I'm used to, but it was phenomenal. Yeah. And you can definitely see the, you know, the homage to it, it, This it's a game that rewards doing things quick, doing it stealthy, doing it essentially non-lethal, you mm-hmm. know, doing it in the most efficient way possible. Oh, oh yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah, which also that's adds my, to... That's, that's all the disclaimer I'll put on that. Yeah, it was, dude, we'll get into some of our escapades. Like last night, you shot somebody in the head. We did so good the whole meet, the whole <laughs> mission. And he's like, Dude, you see the gun that's in my hand? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. I listen. I <laughs> there was a there was a gun that was I've never seen it. It was amazing, and I'm like, well, how am I not gonna shoot this at least once? So <laughs> I'm like, you psychopath. He had a family. We could have put him out. We could have tased him. So you know, we have uh, a blast with this game. But you said the studio launched in 2016, right? Um, um, well, yeah, we officially became a studio 2017, but the game development started in 2016. And what, what was the year that Aspire 1 officially came out? It was um, November 2019. And did you come from, uh, I guess I could say, a game development background prior, or is this kind of your first entry into the gaming industry? Yeah, it was first entry, uh, no experience as a game dev. It did show, I think, like as <laughs> nearly all our team, other than our narrative designer, had never worked on a game. And so it was actually the first game I worked on. You know, there's usually the, the um, advice of like, you should try and do a bunch of small games. 
before trying a big one, but this was it. And so, yeah, definitely fraught with, you know, challenges and lots of learnings, both of them. But, um, yeah, they, they made it, which was awesome. They got out the door. <laughs> Well, you also look at the years, that's right at the, the re, reasserted, you know, VR coming big again with the DK1, the DK2 and stuff. So you got in at a good time. Uh, but what were the kind of the challenges as with never being involved? Yeah, just stepping into it blind and saying, I'm going to go into the VR world. It's got to be absolutely frightening. Which at the time, you know, we're in 2013 or 2023. It's kind of a little bit more you know, the trial and errors have, but have been done. People know kind of quote unquote, the correct ways well, to and do let's, things. Let's just put it out there now that like graphically with Aspire 2. Oh, it's pushing the quest too. It's, it's, it's friggin' amazing. Mm -hmm. the, the graphics are, they're, they're tight. You know, the actual function of the game is tight. So more importantly of like, how do you go from, from <laughs> like never doing it before to doing it and then doing it again. And just like, in my opinion, somewhat crushing it. Yeah, what I mean, was it like getting no experience to Aspire 1 as your first ever game? What was that process like? I was, um, it was a fun nightmare. <laughs> that was a, <laughs> a quote I gave once and we put it on the wall because everyone on the team thought it was a good summary. I think in the end, like launching Aspire 1, we, it was our first release. We were super proud. It did kind of get half a star out of five on the PlayStation 4, so... That was like soul crushing. Um, we did we did try our best to turn it around. Six months later, it was three and a half stars out of five. So we th we thought, you know, this is a a, a turnaround for it. I, I think the there was challenges all along the way. I, I think the very first challenge was kind of convincing people to give us cash to make the game, uh, and so that's why it kind of took three years to get there. And the development went through VR's first kind of nuclear winter in 2018. Five and the, the Rift and the PSVR 1 were kind of over. And so there's a generation of insanely cool games that just never uh, released in 2018 or were in development and they've, they've just been lost to the sands of time. And we were just very lucky at that point to have kind of got greenlit with Espire to kind of uh, weather through that and then launch six months after Quest 1 had released, which was for us, you know, the, the real game changer. And so are you, are you at this point, you know, standalone VR board? You know, I, it, I get the impression it was much more well-received than a half star on the Quest we, 1 at launch, you know. At this point, is, is the Quest platform your main focus? Uh, I, it was for our sequel. We this, we could probably talk the a brief summary of the development, but the 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 quick version of it was we launched day one on every platform in 2019 for Aspire One. So that was Steam, Rift, Vive Port. They are kind of like separate channels on the PC. They've got their own you know SDKs and platform tools and stuff like that. Then we launched on PS4 and Quest One, and that was all day one. And so Understandably, the game was a bit rough around the edges. We learned a lot from that. At the time, we thought it was ready, uh, and we obviously learned it, it wasn't ready. It was very much a symptom of that, you know, VR is super-duper high risk, and so to get the game greenlit, we agreed that we'd launch on all, all the platforms to try and make the most of a marketing budget. And then in the aftermath of that, it did find its biggest audience on the Quest 1. Actually, there's six and a half thousand people that still play Aspire One every month now, and um, twenty something percent of them are Quest One users still, which is weird for a um, for VR games in 2023. And so, based off that experience for Aspire Two, we decided we'd focus initially on the Quest Two as a launch platform. We thought, well, look, we tried um, we tried all the platforms that clearly didn't work. And Tripwire, our publisher, and, and Load, we both agreed, let's just go for one this time, like try and maximize one platform and branch to the others. I think in hindsight of that one, like because it's always learning, we, sh we should have gone for two instead of four or something. But, um, yeah, that's where it's ended up. So that's why Aspire 2 was a lot more focused because we could um, really design first for one platform and, and it's a lot easier to scale up than trying to scale down. Now, as a Quest 2 user, I'm I'm grateful for it. 
But that actually explains a lot too, Mm -hmm. because I mean, again, it's like, you know, there's a lot of good graphic games and then there's games that I say have great graphics and I I put this one up there with more of the, the great, you can tell it's optimized for correct. The quest too. So I'm I'm actually not upset at that answer at all. (laughs) And you know, that was kind of the, the T T L D R, you know, the too long didn't read, but uh, do you want to go a little bit deeper into you know, not really what went wrong, but what were kind of some of the the challenges that happened at launch and, you know, what you did to kind of rebound back from that with updates and fixes and and such? Yeah, totally. I I can give a brief summary there for Aspire One's challenges and development, because I think it's a fun story. The the game was kicked off. I'd come from a different industry, which was 3D artist. So I I was doing and, and familiar with doing 3D art and motion graphics for uh, offline rendering. So usually I'd design animations that would take 90 minutes per frame to render. So if you've got 25 frames a second, you know, you'd sort of leave it over the weekend on 10 computers, which is, that's called offline rendering, pretty common. And so when, when I saw VR, I was like, holy crap, 90 frames a second, you know, to, and you could s- sort of be present in the 3D meshes that you're making. You'd see them real world scale. So after about two years of just trying uh, hard as I could to get any kind of VR project in the door throughout 2014 and 15, um, my, I actually worked in this studio that, that's in my background. So my my boss, my landlord, um, it was just the, the two of us and another guy upstairs. And then um, I made a video over the Christmas break of 2016 saying, this is Aspire. It's um, Metal Gear and VR. And it had this prototype video that showed some interesting mechanics like you could actually pull the magazine out of the weapon yourself and throw it and use voice commands to hold up the guard and it got um it got quite a bit of interest on reddit for the time and that kicked off everything four of the people that worked on the game with me contacted me that day they just kind of came out of the woodworks and they were like oh yeah you're making metal gear in vr i'm, I'm gonna be doing that too <laughs> and it was awesome because you, you kind of found the same people that were like super passionate about the game and so that was our lead level designer narrative designer senior programmer and a um, 2d 3d animator and so from that too there was interest from various publishers including tripwire interactive they just launched at that time killing floor incursion and so that and that was an early vr game from a a mid-tier publisher that tripwire at the time pretty big They're, they're quite massive now and so that basically led to a few months where I was working my full-time job and an industry friend said, or colleague basically just said, Hey, I'll, I'll loan you 16 grand. And so quit your job. And, and if you, if it all falls over, you can pay it back. You know, maybe it takes half a uh, decade or decade, but you can just, you should give it a go because you're not going to make it if you're just doing it in the evenings. And so my parents also loaned me some cash. And so I, I did just that, took half a year off and used that to pay the early members of the team. And we created a, a, a prototype of our game, Aspire. And by this point, we were about, it was about August of 2017 and I was trying to pitch it to everyone, uh, HTC, NVIDIA, for some reason, I thought NVIDIA would fund the game, <laughs> Valve, uh, definitely Oculus. Oculus at the time were like, you know, you guys are on the other side of the world, have no track record. We will give you a rift. So we got a free <laughs> Oculus rift, which is on my wall in the background. And, um, but, but they said, come back later. You know, it's definitely not ready yet. And so the, that was that first challenge for us, which was getting Aspire. Um, but the whole time we thought we just need to sign it to get full development, but we had to pass all these gates. So the prototype gate, we finally passed in October where we gave it to the CEO of Tripwire, John Gibson. He played it and said, look, the game is pretty rough, but the one thing that, that I like is it's the first time I've been able to circle strafe around an enemy and not throw up because we had a, a tool in there called the Control Theater Comfort Mode. It's kind of like a glorified cockpit view where it renders this cube in your peripheral vision. And um, it really worked to, at mitigating VR sickness. And so for him, he's like, this is this could be a game changer. This could be, you know, a tool that lets the doom of VR come to life where people could maybe not, you know, chuck up their guts 
first time they used VR. So, so yeah, like they, they, it basically gave us an opportunity to make a vertical slice. Do, do you think your listeners would be aware of a vertical slice? No, uh, you could educate away. Is please. that like a demo reel kind of? But no, please explain it better. Yeah, it's pretty much a demo. Like the, it's a pretty common industry term where, a, and it's also a bit of a challenge. So a vertical slice is kind of like if you imagine your game and horizontally you could see this, the music, the sound effects, so all the audio. You could see the gameplay interactions, the enemy AI, all the features, the um Basically, every element that makes your game, the, the visuals are, are critical. And a vertical slice is kind of getting a knife and cutting straight down that cake and, and basically trying to ch- carve out maybe 10 minutes of, um, of, of gameplay. And the idea is that you would give that vertical slice, in our case, to someone they put the headset on, and they truly evaluate it as the developer saying, this is our game. You know, you're playing it. Uh, for 10 minutes straight, when you take the headset off, you can just imagine an eight more hours or something. And so the vertical slice is a tool that there's sort of no questions really. Um, a, a publisher would play it and be like, I I can see where the bar is for you all and, and maybe you need to go higher or lower. So they are kind of brutal to make because <laughs> you, you, it's kind of like you, on the outside, it all looks great, but in the background you're, you know, um, using st- sticky tape to put it all together so because the outcome is just 10 minutes of gameplay and so you might make something that works great there but then for a full game you should remake it because you might have to write whole new systems but um that was our second kind of challenge we, we finally got this vertical slice we, we made it in four months um five people and so this by this point we're in the middle of June 2018 and we had our vertical slice it was an hour and a half a common theme I've learned with our company is we just over um overshoot um, too too much and so it was it was kind of like a it was pretty innovative very much inspired by goldeneye that it had three difficulty tiers um goldeneye 007 and the level completely opened up so if you played it on the um vr operative difficulty the hardest one it was about an hour and a half to finish if you played it on agent difficulty or aspire agent it was it was a third the size and so all the objectives would change and our publisher basically said, which was completely spot on, no one's going to play it. Like, the, you know, things have, times have changed since the 90s. And so the average player might play your game once. Like the, the overwhelmingly, um, you know, um, number of players. And so it'd be a waste of time to make, you know, levels in that way. So we did learn a lot, but we, we took that vertical slice over um, John Gibson of Tripwire flew me over from Australia to the USA, so it was first time ever leaving, um, second time leaving the country, and um, first time going over to the states. And so we were invited to Oculus to pitch. Um, so Meta were called Oculus, and so we, mm-hmm. which pretty much all your listeners would know, <laughs> but just in case, you know, down the track, we have we have the new guys or something like that, you know. Yeah. They actually gave us four and a half hours to pitch the game at their um, at Facebook. So we, we kind of went there and we spent two hours pitching it and they were playing our vertical slice and then, you know, more people came back and played and it was like the, the coolest pitch um, experience ever. And we were actually making the pitch deck in the taxi on Uber on the way there. And luckily the driveway to get into Facebook was so long we could make two more slides while <laughs> while in there because it was such a rush to to put it all together. Um, we pitched it to Sony as well uh, um, on that trip and it was also a similar experience. They, we didn't have quite as much time, but they gave us a tour of Foster City, um, Sony Interactive Entertainment. And then from that, it actually took five more months to get Espire Greenlit because at that point it was right in the, the lowest VR point, middle of 2018. And so the retent players were gone, the, the um, headsets weren't selling. And at that point, it got to a point where it really became clear the only way this game is going to get green- greenlit is if we support the Oculus Santa Cruz day one and if we launch all platforms day one. And so we just said, sure, we'll do it. <laughs> and um, we'd never, I didn't even, it wasn't sight unseen. We had seen the, the Santa Cruz turned into the Oculus Quest, but 
we'd never developed for Android and we just thought, cool, we just, we'll do it. And so we actually <laughs> greenlit Aspire One with a five-month development period. It was meant to start December 2018 and launch on the Quest, which was going to be May um, 2019. And we we're so far out of that launch date. Like we, we just thought, yeah, we'll do it in five months. How long does a game take to make? Five months seems reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that to try and wrap it up, like the largest challenge I think was that final development push. It was 11 months in the end of, of how we delayed the game four times. Two of them were public. There were so many cool bits though. We, we got to go to E3 2019 and present the game and, and John Romero, um, the designer of Doom, played it, which was like a bucket list uh, moment and John Carmack, the famous John Carmack, also he didn't play it, but I showed him videos of it, which was another kind of checkbox. The game got this natural hype around it um, because of we were saying it was you know inspired by Metal Gear, and the that challenge was we sort of developed it first for PC and then halfway through pivoted to launch on the Quest, and so there was just this kind of big learning for us of like, wow, these levels that we've made are just not designed for standalone VR. It, the, it's kind of 50 times less powerful. The Quest 1 was is a very limited headset. It's um, not capable of, of much at all. And so when it finally launched, we thought, wow, this game's uh, awesome. And then we realized in our post-mortem, um, we spent too much time trying to make the game run uh, than trying to make it awesome. You know, all these different platforms, we were just – constantly trying to get technical things fixed instead of gameplay things fixed and so with the initial kind of negative reception of the game we kind of just took it as like we got to fix this and so we spent the next six months in particular like really working on the game and by the time we released our sixth three free update we thought this is where the game should have been when we launched it and um and then we yeah moved towards aspire 2 while still trying to support aspire 1 a bit that's an awesome, that's awesome crazy story. It's awesome. Yeah, it is awesome to watch how, I mean, and I mean, yeah, you, you might've been able to come out of the gate and had, have the finished product that first go around, but for someone jumping into it, you know, fresh, I don't think that's bad at all. No. And it's, it was from my understanding, by the time we hopped into standalone VR, Aspire one was always a game that I heard spoken highly about and mm-hmm. Aspire two had some hype. So from the outside, you know, just as a consumer, I never heard bad things about Aspire no. One by the time no. that I had I had a headset, you know. So did you pretty much start on Aspire Two right after you were done kind of polishing up the release of Aspire One? We we started on it um pretty soon after Aspire One because also as a first time studio, we didn't know what to we didn't know what to do. <laughs> When you finish a game, it's like, what are we meant to? We hadn't planned like a post release roadmap or we didn't have a pipeline of works. One of the things um, about this company was we were just like constantly running out of cash. And so, all <laughs> through that 2017 to 2019, we just kept getting closer and closer to these like terrible D Day moments and had a ton of support. We, we did a bit of B2B, like basically VR work, but not for games along the way just to sort of um, fund the company. And Tripwire were awesome. They There was a few dry spells and they just said, oh, can you guys work on Killing Floor Incursion? You know, the game had been out for three years and there was like really not a need to do it, but they were just like, just do some work on it. And so we would work on an update for them. And when the game finally launched, we for a few months didn't know, we thought this is going to be a commercial failure because we uh, – didn't partially it's because of the way some of the consoles report like it's um you, you don't really know the numbers and for a couple of weeks but also the reviews were pretty negative but suddenly the quest version was doing awesomely for Aspire one it was like a top seller in 2020 and and i think it was just the magic of the time it launched there wasn't really many shooters i think i learned the day onward came out on quest one the sales of SY1 permanently dropped by half and they never really recovered. And, and I learned a lot from that because I thought, how's Onward a competitor? Like we're stealth single player. And I realized it's just because people are starved for games. Like they they would want Onward, but there isn't one. So we'll, we'll play Aspire. And so the, the good thing about it was though that 
meta were really um, happy with us. We the budget of that game was pretty small, but it paid for itself in a, in in the end. It was really five weeks, and it was recouped, which was you know for a VR game impossible. Like it was, um, and so as a result, we actually pitched meta. Um, Straight after launch, we actually did a week-long game jam as a company. We were pitching ideas. We're about to do one actually today. We're kicking off a week-long game jam again. And out of that, we came up with a bunch of ideas and Meta particularly wanted to see Espire. So we sort of pitched them this pretty small game. It was going to take us five months, but they said, no, no, do a sequel. Like if, um, <laughs> you know, if you want where the industry is at the moment, you should probably aim high for a sequel because um, it's a, an opportunity that may not be there again, if you know. And so we thought, well, yeah, we pitched Aspire too, and COVID happened at that time. It was March twenty twenty, and so it took another nine months to pitch that game. But we finally got that one greenlit, and it was a much bigger production. We were a team of eleven people, and we just designed Aspire two to need twenty four people for no reason really. Well, it, I, I feel like because we. We did. We aimed high. Like we thought, this game's got to have uh, improvements across the board. And when we first pitched it, we were told, oh, "This is a an evolution. You know, if you want to make a sequel, it needs to be a revolution." And so we, you not ha- you don't have enough revolutionary features. And so we then came back and with Cinder and Sooty, two frames, and and the idea that y- you've got your interpupillary distance, and in the headset, you know, you set your kind of eye distance and we could use software to scale it so suddenly the world looked massive and we could also scale the whole world bigger or smaller so no matter what your height was if you played cinder you're always six foot and sooty you'll always be three foot and they were like all right that's a that's a revolution because it changed the potential for gameplay was huge and then we had a few other we thought were revolutionary features like you turn the lights on and off but um between tripwire and meta they were like this you've got to have multiplayer and we were like, oh, we can't do multiplayer. We, we, we don't know how to do multiplayer. <laughs> we really didn't know how to do multiplayer. And they're like, no, no, it's it's 2020. If the game's going to launch in 2022, you have to have multiplayer. And so we, we, we realized, like, this is a contingency uh, for the game to get signed. So we thought, cool, we'll have multiplayer. <laughs> and, um, and that's where it ended up. Like, we, we, we added a co-op multiplayer mode. Our strategy was we would have all of the multiplayer levels set in Aspire 1's um, environments so that from day one we could work on multiplayer. Otherwise, our time production timeline would mean that our multiplayer maps if would be ready much later. So it was a com- – uh, and where the visuals really improved, we, we hired some amazing people. There's an amazing team that works on this game, but we, we were lucky to hire some more amazing people and they were senior-level people. So we were bringing people into the company that have – finished multiple games and one of the people we bought on the visual side had worked on LA Noir in here in Australia and the original Prey in 20, 2006 and had tons of experience with consoles like the PS3 and PS2 Xbox 360 era so knew a lot of the tricks and so that helped us a lot and then our art team grew out as well it was a lot of um, a few junior people on our team but they just totally kick butt and and um yeah the game actually in the last year transformed completely and finally i think we got we got an insane ai designer um who joined in our interview said oh i um i like aspire one but here's a game it's called aspire one with an a instead of an e and i played it on the quest and he basically in a week redone the ai of our game was better than our ai and i thought oh my god we've got to got to get this guy and found an insane game designer. We, we'd never had a game designer in the company. So, yeah, a lot of people joined for Aspire 2 to kind of, you know, help us lift it beyond what, what it, the sequel, original was. Well, I think it's cool that people saw the value in what was being done, though. And I'll say selfishly, I mean, I love the co-op of Aspire 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I had any wish in the game... Mm-hmm. You know, we'll get into the upcoming mixed reality mode, but I wish that the entire campaign of Aspire 2 was co-op. That's how much fun we have with it. So I will give props to the publisher, to Tripwire. 
I will give props to Meta. Mm-hmm. They I were do, right. I do think they made the, the good call on that because, you know, we were even referencing it a little off air before the interview. We were playing the game last night and in tears, laughing, just being absolutely ridiculous with each other, picking up the enemies, you know, I'll let people use their imagination, you know. We're oh, just yeah, having you much- can manipulate the dead NPCs. Yeah. Have yeah. fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, you know, you spend forever, it's going to reflect your final score, but it's a video game. It's about having fun anyway, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to my knowledge, you can't make money in this game. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> I've never I've yeah. never personally okay. done it. I just I mean, look at the results and go, we are expensive. We did 100000 better. Than last time, and we last were time, still negative still 170. Negative. Oh, yeah, we're <laughs> terrible. But it's just because we're having fun, you know? So the reception to co-op, um, is that a kind of a common thing you hear that people are silly, they're laughing, they're having fun? You know, what's the reception? Or are people going for, like, you know, more the of a high militant, score. militant style of it. Because there is a leaderboard, too, and don't get me wrong, we can flip that switch into competitive and things <laughs> change to a completely different side, too. But, yeah, what's that reception been like have, have people love the co-op like we said do is do they wish that there's more and what's the way that people kind of typically seem to play it yeah i i think overwhelmingly people have enjoyed the co-op and said there should be more levels we um totally have heard it uh, I, I agree i i think we if we had our timelines right we should have made the single player campaign have co-op support for sure and it was it was a decision at the time of, I think it was the right one that way. We, we could have changed other things, but just to make, we, we had it siloed. So the single player campaign and co-op were independent and they just couldn't break each other in a good way. We could iterate as much as we could on the single player campaign and, and just know that the multiplayer wasn't going to be broken because it was a real challenge just to just for the team to just get multiplayer to work. And it was because we had stuff like 18 guards really at a time that are, you know, using their AI routine. So it's pretty high on the CPU. And there's a lot of gameplay mechanics like, um, you know, the noise maker that distracts enemies or hand cameras look around corners. Um, the, the fact that Cinder and Sooty are different heights, so the world scales differently for one player versus the other. So that alone was kind of like nightmarish. And we... A big issue, we didn't lock down our objectives early enough, so what objectives you're going to do are really key if you're going to make them work with multiplayer. So we um, you know, we thought we'll just keep them separate and people, um, yeah, seem to have fun. I mean, we, we have fun in the studio. We, we have an update actually coming out in around about a week and the last level of testing, I'm usually personally involved to kind of sign off on it and we don't have debug mode enabled so we can't cheat. Not that I need to cheat, but um, I often turn on invincibility and invisibility just to, you know, uh, evaluate the game. And without that playing multiplayer, I, I was like, oh, my gosh, um, we we really trying to play stealth, keep it quiet so that we can, you know, run through the game. We're trying to sign off all the visuals and it's like we've got to just survive. And so it is fun because you've, you've got the team. We're in a massive kind of open plan building for anyone that's doing the video. It's kind of half... Uh, downstairs and then we've got this upstairs bit and so if anyone's talking at the level I am like everyone could hear it and um, (laughs) so while doing a multiplayer review the whole um, there's myself and someone in there and the whole team are watching and then the stealth run just goes really bad and um, (laughs) it's very fun (laughs) because we're still trying to like log tickets and log issues and um you know might be like oh wow there's a gap in the wall there can you go back and look at it so someone that's watching the stream can get a screenshot and we're like in a minute we just got to um <laughs> take out these guards and so yeah the co-op testing um meta actually offered a and tripwire as well they both did these insane uh ux reviews so they would review people would play the game and give feedback for user experience and so the co-op was the biggest part of it like it was we got so much feedback and we also had um tripwire's game director um on their publishing side reviewing a lot because they're a company that their multiplayer is their dna with killing floor and um with um red orchestra the, the, the those games support like 64 players they just done shivery too so 
yeah, we, we had a lot of feedback. The overwhelming feedback was just there should have been more and we should have taken it further. So, yeah, we, hopefully in the future we could, you know, take that again. It's definitely something we think as a team like, wow, there's a foundation now like for co-op if we, you know, learn from what we've done. We could add more stuff. So are you able to say what the update coming yeah, next week is? Yeah, I have just I had a big check mark next <laughs> to that. Yeah. I mean, it's it, basically one of the big things we've been working on is this mixed reality game mode. It's only started in February. So the team's like worked crazy to get it off the ground and it's been technically hard. But our strategy for that has been to release it as a free update for Espire 2. And so... As a result, we need to do a pretty major Unreal Engine upgrade uh, under the hood to support the latest um, you know, technology. And so we've done that upgrade. And so this update, the major feature in the background is that engine upgrade. So we've kind of swapped. It's all boring stuff. It won't really be in the release notes. But you know, there's sort of an engine upgrade post-launch is not a good idea usually. And we've swapped like the renderer of over to Vulcan. So the performance should be better um, and there's a bunch of quality of life stuff, but the main um, feature is weekly challenges. So there's only, I think, about six to ten games on the Quest Store that do weekly challenges where Pistol Whip is like the gold standard. You you play it and there's like a time-limited challenge by the developer and we're using uh, Meta's challenge backend for it. And with Espire 1, I think that's what's kept a lot of people playing. We've had weekly challenges for for about two years, and so we bring him to e- Aspire 2 um, as a major feature for this update. And, and a big thing is just to kind of prepare for the next one, which is our mixed reality thing with this engine upgrade. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes. We're hoping the weekly challenges will um, get p- people excited about the game. So I'm definitely excited for the mixed reality mode. Yeah, uh, more, and, and I, th- I was very skeptical like a year ago of mixed reality and now you're I, the biggest think, advocate <laughs> well because we're getting close to like you know color pass through and that's pancake lenses so i think that's going to make mixed reality so much better than trying to do it on the quest too so well i remember last night while we were playing the ufc fights were going and it was a fight i cared about and i was like i understand why we can't yet but i wish in the quest too you know i could open up a window <laughs> in a window and, and watch the fights while i play a game and you're like well dude once we've get the quest three with color pass through you'd be able to watch the tv TV. (laughs) and i'm like damn it that's too (laughs) obvious i was like so yeah i'm the potential for mixed reality is is endless what's mixed reality going to be like in aspire 2 though yeah that was kind of going to be my my next thing are you revamping it so the whole campaign can be played mixed reality is it like specifically designed missions just for mixed reality and how exactly does that work it's um it's specifically designed missions so it, we it's a game mode we don't know how many we'll ship at the moment we have nine we just on friday kind of reached an internal alpha where we have nine levels and that that are at alpha ready and there's a further kind of nine it's unclear if we'll ship them less or more essentially it's been really hard like what how because we've learned along the way like about mixed reality like the biggest thing is you have you're designing blind you have no idea what anyone's room is like also at the moment as a user you actually have to draw the room yourself if you guys use the scene the room setup tool where you have to add yeah i did my, desks. my yeah but not 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 perfect. to the detail not no. to everything but you've used it i up. did my couch my wall my window my mm-hmm. door a uh, little computer table it's not the easiest no yeah it, it wasn't a hundred percent I mean, I'd rather a scan, just Mm -hmm. done. Absolutely. The friction is really high. And um, where the flip side, though, is that I think it's a – I'm probably a self-professed, like, meta slash Oculus fanboy, so I have to put that out there. I've always been pretty positive because I kind of felt that they were, you know, big in kind of supporting Aspire to get happened. So I'll always appreciate that. But So I'll say I I like the scene API, which is that – this this setup where as a developer you kind of receive everyone's walls and everyone's desks and if they've decided to add windows and doors or couches you know as a developer you could make a game that uses that uh information and so the the potential there is unlimited really like it and from a technical point of view i think it's really cool but at the moment yeah the friction is just 
incredible. Like we, we've been watching people have to draw the room set up and it's, it is like pulling teeth. There's rumors, you know, unsubs- there's, there is rumors that in the future, the a quest three may be able to scan. Um, you know, I don't know if, um, at what level, um, but that will make it way better <laughs> to scan a room. But still, once it's set up, we've basically been trying to make a game and where, we've, where we have ended up is we're going to present the user, this may change, with a, um, a UI that shows a series of small levels and large levels. And we want to essentially um, support as many places as possible. This might sound crazy, but we've been in it for, <laughs> for months now. Where we've ended up is our minimum size again, it may change, is, is sort of 2.5 by 2.5 metre room. So that's kind of like our minimum supported size and then with a desk in it because we're, you've got to think about wall space and floor space to, to make stuff happen because you could have like a 6 by 6 metre room full of couches for some reason. There's no floor space. So we have that as a minimum and then we have like our standards room which is more like 3 by 4 metres and then our large rooms are like bigger than the studio here. And the reason we've done that is because we've learned that you can't control what people are going to do <laughs> when, with this room setup. Like so, you can't stop people from doing right angled um, or non right angled walls. It, it's just such a unknown. And so you have to design blind and where we've ended up is that a set of levels that kind of are designed for small and for large, if they're large, we split the user's space like the one behind me into zones. So in code, we're kind of like it's measuring everything and turning it into at least two zones. And then we can design things like let's have a retinal scanner in zone one and let's have the player start there and let's in zone two have enemies. So you have to kind of knock them out and bring them back to the retinal scanner. And between zone one and two, let's put a laser wall or something like that. So we can at least design, no matter if someone's got a room shape like a star or a room shape like an owl, we can at least design. And then our small missions are much less, uh, we're assuming less than one zone and we are designing within that. But to just describe the gameplay, it's it's all the mechanics of Aspire, so except the ones that require artificial movement. So there's no artificial climbing because that wouldn't work, you, you know. <laughs> um, there's no thumbstick movement, but there's everything else. You, you move around your space enemies enter your room or they're behind walls you can use your trank launcher and shoot enemies or you can grab your repair tool off your wrist except it's your real arm so it's it is pretty immersive you you then sneak up on enemies knock them out you can grab them muck around with the rag dolls you can actually <laughs> throw them through windows that are cut into your wall so you can throw them into the virtual environment to clear out your space and you can hide in lockers so that's where you got VR to AR. Like there's lockers from the game, pretty popular. You you go in it and you close yourself in the locker. And in terms of objectives, there's a concept of essentially we call them chained objectives. And so it starts off simple, but our design philosophy is kind of variety. Hopefully players will kind of see something different every time. But to try and describe a mission, you might have a space that's similar to this one. And when it begins there is a lever. When you pull the lever, a um, big roller door opens up at the other end of the room, but also this spinning trip mine tower opens up. And so you have to kind of like move around it. It's a bit like a Ferris wheel to dodge the lasers. And an enemy soldier might come out of the um, room. So you've got to knock the guard and drag him over to a retinal scanner. That opens up a hack laptop where you have to hack and then get to the end surviving. So the idea is chained objectives, you, you know, like do this to do that, to do that, to do that. And so the gameplay can be a bit action, a bit puzzle, um, and a bit stealth. Like there's one map at the moment where there's no bad guys. It's all about finding stuff because there's natural occlusion. So, if you know, if you have walls or desks, things can actually be hidden behind it. And then there's levels that are more elimination focused. So you're mostly just shooting enemies in the virtual space beyond. So, yeah, hopefully there's variety. But we've learned that it's a real um, – it's the most challenging project we've worked on by far just because we don't know anything. We're just guessing, like, what people will like or won't. So we're going to need to do a lot of testing. I, uh, the, I, am, I The setting the bar high is an understatement. I'm hyped. Oh, yeah. That dude. sounds like so much fun. 
Well, yeah, it's in your it's in your freaking space. Obviously, I'm, I'm amazed at the amount of like all the unknown factors that's got to go into. Like you were saying, I mean, you don't know where everybody's room setup is or how their their guardian set up. No. And because that this is something that has to be single player, of course, but it's so cool. It makes up for that. I'm curious if in the future there will be. I don't know how you would do multiplayer. Mixed you can reality. totally do it, guys. <laughs> I mean, really? we're not doing it now for our game because it's expensive. <laughs> but if you uh, just from a hardware point of view, or software <clears throat> point of view, if you had two quests, it could be Quest 2, 3, or Pro in the same space, you can play multiplayer. They call it shared spatial anchors. So I hope, I actually can't remember seeing any MR games yet that are using that feature. And I have to say it's probably because you're you're asking for a lot. You're asking for people to have the same game, same headset, same space, and also have to draw a room. Like it's just, forget it. But I do think it's going to be, if if M mixed reality takes off, it's going to be pretty fun. I think the game changer that's going to be the smart scan that rumored potentially in the works that we've all heard about. You know, if that happens and two people can just go over the same house, and like I think the biggest friction to that of all the things that you listed is drying the space appropriately yeah. in both headsets. So if you can remove that friction, we hang out sometimes. We have the same, not sometimes, but once a week. Mm-hmm. We have both have headsets. <laughs> We both have a lot of the same games. I mean, it's something that we could do, but the biggest limitation would be, do you really want to draw my home environment with my couches and everything like that? But if I you mean, could just put it on and scan. Well, well, how's this? To date, there hasn't been... I mean, I get drawing like the computer table and stuff. If you can really use your laptop on it, that makes mm-hmm. total sense. But there hasn't been a reason to have to... Mm-hmm. If you're telling me that, like, it's in my best interest to get the most bang for my buck out of your game is to draw an accurate play space. <laughs> you're saying you're spending an hour doing it, no problem. It'll be the most detailed <laughs> freaking play space you've ever seen. I'll put every, if there's a cup, I'll put it there. I don't <laughs> care. Because I, I know there's a reason to do it versus like, hey, this is a cool feature you can do, but yeah. there's no real reason to... But now that this, you know, mixed reality is going to be more dependent upon. But I also got faith Meta is going to have some sort of ability to. It's just too obvious. It's the need is there. It's too much of a. Well, is again for mixed reality. It's like it's obviously mm-hmm. important. The unexpected gem of the quest. But I, I yeah. love seeing that this studio is not slowing down. It's like you're pushing your your own bar further and further, and and mixed reality being really it's an unknown area right now to me it's like not everyone's yeah. doing it a few select are so you i mean you're really the the water testers for this one yeah and i, we, I think of sorry keep going oh sorry you go damon i was gonna say i think of like resolution with demio battles and that mm-hmm. was originally going to be part of demio and then they made that pivot to make it its own standalone game was there was there ever that same talk with this mixed reality update of do we do this as a its own game or an update or was it always the decision that no this is just going to be a feature part of Aspire? I um, mean the jury's out at the moment like we're not totally sure we we wanted to make it a feature of Aspire because um the truth is Aspire two hasn't sold all, um, that well this year so um mm-hmm. around the studio you know not slowing down in the background we actually have a I, I like to be transparent. We actually have had a pretty big downsize as a company. We've we've pretty much halved. Um, not trying to slow down, but um, it, it's just kind of been the the reality of the of the of the year. And so the thought process was: if we make this a free update to Aspire Two, and we target Quest Three, hopefully we can launch it day one. Hopefully, we, there's a title there in Aspire Two that's got you know single player co-op with VR and also a mixed reality mode. But we are considering also maybe we try to um, carve out the MR side of it and put that on App Lab or something. Um, the dream um, between between us <laughs> and all the listeners is we'd love to do a standalone version of it maybe in like half a year or a year more that adds a lot more. But um, it, it's just we'd see if we could get funding or support for that, like whether it's local government or something because to self-fund at the moment, something like that it is pretty hella risky you know it's- well i'll be uh i'll be honest i support the standalone versions i remember demio got a little 
you know, criticism or resolution got criticism because, oh, they said it was going to be yeah. hard, then it wasn't. But they but, gave so much for free. And I'm always of the belief of I'd rather see it standalone and more expansive. So if it ever goes that route, hey, I'll be the first one supporting it. Um, but well, kind of, in, in, you need to support the devs and the, all the people who work on it because <laughs> otherwise there's not going to be any more <laughs> games. I mean, it's, it's well, I don't we, know. We we say it all the time. It's one of those industries that you actually do see your purchases and your dollar spent go back into the games. You know mm-hmm. how many of our favorite games years later still get updates. Um, so kind of to the layoffs and stuff was part of that. Maybe anticipating selling more games or just kind of the natural flow of the industry. We saw Meta lay off like what twenty thousand people. Yeah, there's so, been a lot of development teams that have scaled down this past year yeah it's not just been you know digital load by any means but you know what factors do you think kind of led to that yeah i I, um i think firstly uh, just to be clear we'll absolutely sell uh, or release this mr as a free update to aspire 2 that we won't change that but we may also offer it um separate just in case people thinking we will pivot (laughs) it'd mostly just be a pivot to offer it you know as well, Additional. If, you, yeah. if you didn't want to buy Aspire Two in its whole, but around the the, the layoffs, the there's a few factors. The, the main one for as a team has been Aspire Two has underperformed a bit. Um, you know, it hasn't sold as much as Aspire One, and we were naively thinking it would sell more. Um, our worst case kind of projection was it'll sell like Aspire One. You know, it's a sequel, the the classic thinking. You know, of a of a amateur studio we're thinking oh well it'll do what e1 did because it's the market there was eight hundred thousand quest ones apparently when aspire one came out and you know by all accounts there's 15 million quest twos so on our math it should do the same like but it, it's actually done less than the original so we thought well, that's a challenge and um that's just on quest first quest not including the fact that we didn't launch on all the other platforms but the a big reason has been the tech downturn like it uh, industry-wide like um just investment funding um new business has been has slowed and the third one was our next major we were almost as bad like and i'll take full accountability for it like with aspire one we had no post-launch plan and with aspire two we almost had no post-launch plan we had a new ceo join us just a year ago who immediately said where's the next game? You've got to get that up. And so we began pitching that for about seven months and it, I have a, I have confidence it'll happen, but it just got to a point where the further we got into 2023, things just got harder and harder. Like we were realizing like, Oh, that, um, these three reasons, like it's hard to pitch a new game when the current one's not doing all that, um, well sales wise. And so at the same time, investments slowing, and so we just reached a point where we had to make a, a major restructure to just sort of live and fight another day um, to, to, to whether I, I see it as a, a second VR winter. Like we had that in 2018 where it really did just decimate a bunch of insanely cool games and studios. And if you were, um, we, and we were lucky at the time we just had a game in production. And so this one we've had to cut, we have had to down, shrink our team while we then focus on and create ourselves a runway to make sure we've got cool stuff going into 2024 and beyond. Well, if you survive the 2018, you survive the pandemic, I, I'm a firm believer you're so you'll survive this. And, and not for nothing. I mean, 2023, the game releases that have just been dropping have been almost like in proportionate to what you'd expect we're we're shocked every week for the most part you look at great releases like barbaria light brigade i talked about that the other week and if they came out a a year ago people would still be talking about them but instead Mm -hmm. we've had 20 great releases so i go back to what you said earlier about you know when onward dropped your sales halved uh do you feel like that part of the reason that maybe it didn't surpass aspire one or, or do the same in sales and that is just the sheer amount of games on the market now, or do you think it was other other factors? I, I think there's probably a few, um, a bunch of factors. Like there's one factor that the game releases picked up a lot. Like there's 
totally been ama- uh, some amazing games coming out. Speaking with devs and also using, you know, the kind of napkin math of multiplying review scores, you know, I, I follow all the games that come out and go, you know, like a bunch of them are underperforming at the moment. Like there's, I think there's also the factor of the Quest 3 coming. So there's just less people jumping into the um, into the ecosystem. And and there's obviously a recession. Um, but I think we're there's a lot that we're also responsible for, like, our, our retro um, developer and publisher after E2 is like, we really didn't um, do our community and marketing right for E2. Like we kind of just rested on our laurels of Aspire 1 and didn't kind of try to generate enough hype for the game, didn't kind of um, get the game out to content creators early or really just talk about our game enough. We didn't kind of try to build our community up to it. We just sort of ha- heads down on the on the game. I think the lack of a multi-platform launch really hurt us on Aspire 2. Like if we'd launched on PSVR 2 or something or Steam on the same day, it would have um, absolutely helped us. We probably didn't also just – and we didn't follow the market enough and, and really kind of – work out how far has the market changed? Like, you know, how, how should we shift to the fact that it's not 2019 anymore? Like it's there's 400 and something games on the Quest 2 at the time. Back in 2019, there was something like 60. So it was just, yeah, m- multiple factors. Understandable. That, yeah. And I mean, you figure we, we figured the average game two years of development and you you're got to really – plan for that product to be relevant two years from then i mean there's so many factors that and then hope we were saying last week that i think we're reaching a point with vr where strategic games dropping are going to start showing up because you're not going to want to go up against yeah in terms of like communicate internal communication amongst different studios of otherwise it's just going to hurt you know gonna hurt some and it's not gonna hurt others but either way yeah. I'd, I'd be scared to like pick a date to release a game not knowing what the other developers were thinking because it only takes a couple of like you said do you want to release a game on the same week walkabout mini golf puts out a dlc no if or, it's or your Ghost, first game ever. ghostbusters drops tomorrow mm-hmm. you know and you had had your game booked forever to drop but they're yeah. gonna shadow your you know i don't care who you are you're probably gonna be pushed aside on the mm-hmm so yeah, and I agree with the community thing. I mean, that's that's an area I think used to be overlooked a lot, but for VR gaming, it seems that everything is more of a community for each game. So that's an important area. So you referenced kind of uh, real quickly review algorithm guessing. We had a developer tell us one time that a rough guess that or a rough number that they use is for every one review. Is thirty game sales? Is that what's what's your little mental algorithm you're using? If I understood that comment correctly, yeah, I'd say that on Quest it could even be a hundred. Like um, one review is a hundred sales. It, it's wow. Pre- a year or two years ago, I'll, we were using more like forty to sixty-five. Okay. And um, but yeah, I, I've personally seen at least you could multiply the review score by a hundred, um, and that's just based off you know. I guess they're slowly getting experience. And um, every game's different, though. Like, there's some games that people review a lot more than others. So it's, but as a result, too, it's pretty hard because you got to kind of, um, there's a pretty big difference there between 30 and 100. Yeah, 100%. I think we heard that maybe like the first two months of us having the podcast, yeah, so two, three months. Over yeah. two years ago. Yeah, so that never may, actually makes get, sense, though. Um, and I know I'm asking a lot of a, of a studio, you know, I asked this question only as a fan, but understandable that <laughs> there's only, it's only realistic that so much can happen. So it's, it, I understand if it's not doable, but you know, going back to if the timeline of release was different, you know, you would have done the full campaign co-op. Uh, is there ever any intention to go back and add co-op to that campaign or is it not really achievable now that the games are already already out uh i think i'd answer that by saying i personally think that vr games are pretty interesting they have this tale that lasts for a long time Aspire one um criminally i'd say we haven't updated it in years like really we'd still do weekly challenges but there's like big updates haven't happened in ages and it's been a capacity thing for us we just haven't properly made the capacity but Aspire one sold 
more in 2021 than it did in 2020, and that's usually impossible for a game. Usually you see a tail that is totally down, but just that game, it was like, wow, that's really, that's a data point. And so to answer that, I I hope one day there's a chance to do um, even a flat screen version of Aspire 2. Um, Forget the co-op, but um, I mean, what I mean is absolutely. We would love to do the co-op one day on the single player. It just comes down to if we have the kind of business case, like, you know, what would we put it on at the moment if we would invest into that for the current game? There's probably other things that we should do more pressingly, like ports and things like that. But um, I I do see both those games as like, you know, uh, I would love for Quest 4, for example, to do what budget cuts have done, like an Aspire Ultimate kind of thing where we've got the first and second game and, bring co-op to the whole th- the whole game like first and and sequel cut down all of to just the good bits like yeah i hope that there's those kind of opportunities with vr to kind of get a, a established game and then remaster it i think what but they've done with budget cuts was awesome you know obviously it's another stealth game massive fan of it it's it's three years old or more for the sequel and they've just relaunched it to a whole because that's the thing vr like every time there's a quest three and that's why i'm so excited or a quest for not just quest but you've got you know things like the apple vision pro just puts eyeballs on and you get these people that have never played vr before join the the industry and it's exciting yeah i'm i'm a, a big advocate of the remaster too you know there's two series besides aspire as well that i can think of it working great with like red Mas- red matter one and two mm-hmm. it's literally a game that rolls right into the next one, two picks up where one ends. And then you look at, I expect you to die. They have the third one coming out. <laughs> yeah. You know, in, in three years, is somebody going to want to go by three of them separate, especially when they are pretty direct continuations into each other. I mean, that's at least the impression I get with three as well. So I could totally see the room for a remaster or, or you know, kind of a, a, def- a remastered edition with them put together and same thing with Aspire. So I totally do think that there's well, especially that as for it. the, these developers, I mean, we've always known they're not working with like the most amount of free reign power to play with. It's, mm-hmm. it's limited at the moment, you know? So it's like when you say quest three and four, it's like, yeah, absolutely. To see what's going to happen when, and these games are going to be looked at as the classics from when VR became popular too. So I could see a demand for people with modern headsets. Well, I can generations from now being like, you know, I want to play them all. And I kind of get the uh, the feeling, you know, I've seen Meta really pushing the marketing of the Quest 3 heavy for the Connect <clears throat> coming up and like they're pretty vocal it's coming this fall. Stay tuned, you're going to get a Quest 3 this fall. Better. Uh <laughs> so I'm thinking that we're going to see good sales in the Christmas, that first Christmas. And I know for us, you know that that first Christmas that we had our podcast, so not two months after the Quest 2 came out, but one year after that, we saw a huge amount of new users come and start listening to the podcast. Mm. I think we're going to see that same thing with the Quest 3, a, a nice boost that first two months after, but then a real nice boost 12 months the later as year. well. Yeah. And I think having, even in that first boost, I think having Aspire 2 have the mixed reality you know, ready and good to go. I'm so excited for this. I mean, I think it's a game that's criminally underrated and based off of what you said as well, criminally undersold. Yeah, I'm a little shocked. I won't be surprised to see when the Quest 3 does come out and those little boosts of headset sales go. I wouldn't be surprised to see Aspire 2 get the love it deserves, you know? Mm -hmm. Hopefully I'm crossing my fingers for you too because it's a great, great freaking game. Yeah, look, we appreciate it and and I think we obviously not going to be um, betting that like, oh, this will happen, like the, <laughs> the sales turn around. But we thought um, we would jump into this MR mode, uh, looking at the Quest 3 and thinking it's 500 bucks and it's got this insane color pass-through with uh, that hat. If they didn't have that, that would have saved a ton of money. So they obviously, you know, think it's important. So we thought, yeah, we'll definitely try and put a um, focus on the mixed reality and see how that goes. And, um, at the same time, we do a bunch of other stuff, but yeah, ho- hopefully that does, um, hopefully does well. And if not, I, I kind of also feel, um, that 
as the market grows, the, the Aspire games are, are narrative games. So I, I listened to your interview with Chris Pruitt a year ago and he was sort of saying how the narrative players will come later. They're, they're not the early adopters. And I thought, cool, that's why it's important to also just try and maintain the games as well so that if if there are people that want to play that kind of game that's kind of a more narrative-focused title, it still runs on the hardware, like at, at a bare minimum. You know, you got to make sure it's supporting them. No, so, yeah. I, I agree with that. And that was a good interview. I, I do hope we can get Chris Pruitt back, especially as big stuff is coming with the... Yeah, he's going to come with armfuls of Quest 3s for all. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I don't think that's the way Chris that... Chris Pruitt clause is what we'll call I don't think that's the way that goes for us over at Rough Talk here, no. but, you know, it would be cool to get him. It's a nice vision. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it again. Aspire Two is a, a great I just, game. I just I I commend you for taking the risks. I mean, I, from to the me, beginning, twenty sixteen. Yeah, and it's like there's always an easier way people could choose to do things, but you're staying on top of cutting edge technology, staying trying to stay to me ahead of the curve, mm-hmm. beat people to the punch, and Looking actually the quest for <laughs> and actually produce a quality product. Yeah, no, I mean that's the that's long term really thinking. Correct. It's jokes aside. It's it, you're not in it. Or a quick buck in VR. No. You're there from the beginning of this this generation of VR from 2016, and you're not going anywhere. They have no intentions to just say, "All right, we gave it our best shot." You know, sorry, it's no. Whatever we got to do, we'll figure it out. We'll keep the ball going, and the the ship's going to turn around no, at some the, point. The you amount know? of um, we hear it all the time. The passion developers have is is legit. You're not going to force. There's no way you're forcing Michael to go to work. You know. No. He's what time did you get into the studio today? Early. Uh six thirty. <laughs> yeah. Just so I mean you know. That's, no, that's it's, that's it's just and the the amount of risk that you not only take going into a a newer market, but again, mm-hmm. trying to accomplish using newer technology that's even newer than the market that not many people are, you know, currently doing. It's gonna make it easy for everyone else down the road. Absolutely. No, I yeah. I love it though. So That's long. why I appreciate the um, chance to be on the podcast because, um, in full earnestly, uh, I I do love your guys' interviews. Like, there's the reviews keeping up with the industry with the news, but it's the developer interviews. I think to the point you're making, they they mean a lot, at least to myself, and I reckon a lot of other budding developers because just recently, Quantar devs like just listening to their strategy. Like, why did they go free to play and hearing their story like oh i had no idea that they developed the game for location based then steam then quest and the interview with jerry ellsworth and hearing her um advice around like needing mentors and i thought it's so true like there's you know people just trying to make cool stuff but if you share the info you can save um you know, I thought, wow, like there's so much stuff I wish we didn't do. <laughs> so there's a chance to just talk about it. So other people listen and go, well, I wouldn't, that sounds ridiculous. Why would I do that? It's like, good, don't do it. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's kind of it, important, I think, because like you said, the the VR devs, you have to be a bit crazy to want to do the risks. And as a result, there's a lot of learnings to share, like the Barbaria devs uh, as well. As an, another example, like got to Heard that, went to GDC and got to meet meet them as well and just chat to them about their games and try and understand like, oh, what's your all journey? So it's, yeah, it's, it's, I think the interviews are hopefully of interest to the broader G, the VR audience, but I, I definitely think there's a niche that you have of other devs as well um, that want to just learn about like what's the um, battle stories and also the um, what what to do, what not to do kind of stuff. No, I definitely appreciate to hear that. Yeah, and I, I guess you've kind of figured that part out because we love being the we love being an outlet for devs to tell their story. And sometimes the stories, you know, like we've done a couple interviews, and some of the last thing we we've talked about was their actual product. It's mm-hmm. it's become more of the you look at Jerry Ellsworth two hour interview an hour forty five <laughs> before we even mentioned till five. You know, yeah, that's the way we it brought goes. up the whole reason. For, <laughs> But yeah, the, the, the journey each person takes, but there's so many common, common things mm-hmm. we hear over and over from the devs. One of them is just do it, start. If you think you want to do it, start. Take and, the chance. But you, you have to be a risk taker. And you know, I do appreciate to hear that too, because if you go back in our library, yeah, we did start doing interviews very early with the first, our first ever interview was 
uh, a gentleman who made an app lab game called Rodent People Origins, mm -hmm. which is a co-op escape room. His name was Tomacost. Co-op escape room is a unique co concept, <laughs> and for its time, App Lab had just dropped. It was a great freaking game. I still stand by it. <laughs> like 12 people have played it, but it's a great game. Um, yeah. But we never really had the intention going into it to do interviews, and it's just something that naturally happened. And by like the third interview, you know, six months into the podcast, it, it was already becoming my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. And I think at this point, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely, yeah. yeah, it's, it's definitely my favorite part of the show. I love doing the, or the, the news. I love doing the reviews. It's never something I'll scrap. And it's always something I love for different reasons, but there's something kind of what you said, hearing the story firsthand. No more, two stories are ever the same. No. And we get to hear it. It's, it's special getting to hear it non-record, you know, before it's in the episode and not that we do any editing, but there's something about just sitting here and, and hearing a story and hearing the passion. It's, mm -hmm. It's and a really talking cool. to because there's quite a few devs we've mm -hmm. spoken to more than once. And it's like you get to to catch up on what's actually been happening for the past year. Yeah. So to hear that you enjoy that aspect, too. Yeah, and that means the world. Yeah, that that definitely makes my my day to hear. Um, and yeah, a lot of cool networking. You meet a lot of cool people. Mm -hmm. You know, you meet some developers in talking about press and, you know, reviewing games. But the real good networking, in my opinion, the real good time you meet somebody is these type of interviews. At least for us. Well, I'm I'm getting to meet the individual and the it's twofold. You get to meet the person and you're also meeting the the business professional. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing both sides and, and again, just the journey and how you've gotten to where you are. To me, I'm always ex I've never done an interview that I've not wanted to do. No, and I never I never thought I would be involved in this side of video gaming, no. but I've <laughs> always wanted to be involved in video games and the deeper that you go into it, the more you learn how much it is an industry. And there's all these different career roles and that the video game industry is a full blown industry. And it's like, holy moly, you know, we're not doing it full time, but we're doing media for the VR industry as big or small as that might be at this moment. We're getting our foot in the door and establishing ourselves. So again, to hear those those words that that definitely means a lot. Um you know, we usually try to keep things around an hour. We pass it a bit. Uh, eh. Yeah, it's been a fun. I think we could easily <laughs> do happens. two on this one. I got one one question. I got to ask a little unrelated. Um, and then I don't know if you have anything else you want to want to ask too, but it's a little silly. I got to ask, though. It's been the rumors everywhere. We've been seeing the headlines. We talked about it a little bit on Monday. I don't know if you even care at all, but Zuck versus Musk. <laughs> who, who do you think is going to win? I, for I, politics, he's gonna say he's Zuck. a Meta fanboy. Yeah. I get it. I kind Zuck. of am too. I kind of am I, too. I, I get never, it. I get I've it. Never, I get it. I'm a Meta lover, but they've never sent me a headset. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't yeah, think this will be answered. I'm gonna be surprising and say Zach. <laughs> I, I, I do think he'll um he would win because he's younger and. I'm a big fan of the Lex Friedman podcast and, and Lex has interviewed both Elon and Mark Zuckerberg and I maybe it's all smoke and mirrors but I just feel that Mark Zuckerberg, whether he's trying to change his image or whatever but or share his approach because I, 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 I think he has a lot of good advice around, you know, if you're going to be a CEO of a company like that, wake up every day, got all this like negativity, just all these fires to put out and then he's talking about how you need to have an outlet. And so just as someone who was a uh, founder of a 10 trillion times smaller company, I realized, wow, I don't have an outlet. I'm, I'm just, you know, our problems are way smaller. But, yeah, that's it's. I can see the kind of thing he's doing with the jujitsu and, and all that. So I thought he, he'd win. Um, what do you guys think? Yeah. Oh, you'll hear it on on Monday's episode on yep. on you know. This, well, I'll, I'll spoil who I want. I, yeah, I'm I'm going Elon all day, and I'm going Zuck. I'm going Zuck because yep. we have it, a good conversation. About yeah, that. I mean, hey, look at this. I'll I'll be I talk about <laughs> it every once in a while. I train jujitsu. I've been training for 13 years. I'm a brown belt. My worlds are colliding with VR and <laughs> jujitsu. I love Lex Friedman too. You know, I have some bucket list people because jujitsu is kind of one of those things that when people get into it, they get into it. So I have like a bucket list people I'd love to train with one day. Lex Friedman's definitely on there. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu yeah. as well. Actually got his black belt from 
a gym in Boston or right outside Boston. We're on the other side of the state, though. And then, you know, he made some money and fled the state. I don't blame the guy either. I'd probably do the same. <laughs> uh, so I'd love to, to train with Lex. But now, damn it, now Zuck's on my bucket list of people I want to train with one day. That would be... Uh, train with Zuck. Good luck. Dude, good luck. You know, Scary. who would have ever thought that? Three three years ago, you would never have said that. But like, You ever if, gotten an email from him? Nope, never will. <laughs> You're not training with him. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, attitude. <laughs> no, we had we had uh this was a this was definitely a a fun interview. Um I don't think we heard what his first ever VR experience was, did we? Nope. We gotta ask that before you go. What was your first ever VR experience? Yeah, it, and then it, I'll let you it, squeeze in anything else if you got anything. Yeah, it changed my um life direction, I think. I ordered the DK one from Oculus and I was a so the first development kit they had was kind of like an Oculus Go. There was no movement left and right. Um, it, you could only rotate. And then just before they sent my order, they said, we've just released DK2. We're going to upgrade it for free, um, you know, because it's DK1 is now discontinued. And so I was like, whatever. And the DK2 <laughs> arrived, and that was a headset. I've still got it on my um, desk all the time. It had a sensor, and it was kind of like this Oculus uh, – sensor to allow for positional tracking we could move your head but i didn't know that i just read the instructions set it all up and my first experience was i expect you to die it was it was at the that time a demo it was just one single kind of vignette level that was about five minutes long and it's in the car on the plane and Mm -hmm. the first thing you do is put the visor down and the laser's aiming at your head and you have to move and i just kept getting hit in the head over (laughs) and over again and and dying and my boss, who had worked with for years, he was watching me. He's like, can I just give it a go? And I'm like, I was thinking like, sure. You know, like, what are you going to do that's different to me? I'm the VR expert. You know, he put the headset on. And as soon as the laser appeared, he just moved to the side <laughs> and it missed him. And I just freaked out. I was like, what What happened? And I put the headset on. I realized I could move. And it just like on that moment, it felt like all these neural pathways in my mind changed. Like, holy crap, you can move in VR and and so I was just trying to make the the tiny camera as large as possible and just never forgot I thought this is a game changer like I just was so entrenched that you could just turn I wasn't even expecting that you could move so yeah never forgot it I that's such a good series that's one of our favorites uh we are so excited for three I hear about it from you weekly Mm -hmm. like can we play it yeah that's one that you could go back into, even though you've already done the, yeah. and I talk about that first level too, of going in and being in that, that is such an Listen, introduction to that series. Graphically yeah. performance audio. I mean, it, it's got the, it holds up so many years later too. Yeah. Such a good yeah. game. So They're that's awesome to hear that that was your first one. Yeah, that's a damn good first one. Yeah. You've got to try and, and like, interview Jesse Shell, the, you know, head of Shell games. Cause he'll, um, he's been in VR for, decades and never left and so i think that's why i expect you to die is such a you know insane level if we can get him we will you know yeah, yeah. Have, we'll reach they, for that they have uh definitely a lot going on between yeah you know i expect you to die among us updates and then you know their new what was it a vampire looking game mm-hmm. that they showed off at the quest showcase too you know uh, so i think we can do it i think we can we'll pull we got for chris it. pruitt we got Lucas Martel. Is we like, got Mike Wentworth. Correct. Over here, These are so. all founders. <laughs> Come on. So. We got this. So, yeah. Thanks a bunch, Mike. Uh, Strass, is there anything else you want to? No, I think we covered a lot. I'm excited to continue to watch this studio grow. I think they, they know how to weather a storm. I don't believe this one will be as bad as years before because there's, no. there's more projects to be done and, you know, things can be. So I'm, I'm excited to watch it all go down. I'd, I'd love to have Michael on again. Mm hmm. Especially after this mixed reality mode drops, uh-huh, exactly. I'm a believer the Quest Three is going to outsell the Quest Two as well. So, yep. uh, before we let you go, Mike, is there anything else you wanted to say? Uh, maybe where the listeners can follow updates of the game, Discord community, Twitter, all that that fun stuff. Sure, yeah, it's um, Espire VR, E S P I R E VR. If you search that, we're from predominantly on um, Twitter and Discord, but on all the other platforms too. As we get closer to the mixed reality mode launching we'd definitely get it out to as many people as we can so i'd love to send you guys early preview of it just to see what your 
unfiltered thoughts are. <laughs> and also we're going to add a mode uh, in our early builds where you can send us your room, not the whole room, but just like the walls and stuff because we're trying to build this library of, of people's play spaces so we can test our game in it and go, okay, it's not working in like half. And why is it? Oh, because like we're not thinking about, you know, whatever, the height of people's ceiling or something. So, well, yeah. I will I will gladly supply data. That is, that is what <laughs> yeah. I, whatever data you need, you will get. <laughs> yes. Do not yeah. worry. Do not fear. Just boxes. It's just going to be like the, the room set up, you know, the simple stuff. But, yeah, we – yeah, I do appreciate the chance to be on the show. And um, yeah, if anyone listening wants to check out Espire, um, where Espire 1 is on all the VR platforms except for PS5, unfortunately, criminally. And Espire 2 is currently on the Quest 2, but it is launching Pico platform within a few days. So that'll be its first port. Nice. Hopefully no, the congrats. first of many too. So again, yeah, we're I- hoping Pico sales can eventually come to North America. So mm-hmm. it'll only get better. I would encourage people to play it though. Please, you'll have fun. Maybe you'll have more fun than we have, but I doubt that. Yeah, we laugh a whole bunch <laughs> in the co op. We are not the secret agents you want doing shit because <laughs> we're loud. We cost you a fortune. We're very expensive. You might get uh, found out and all that stuff, but we have fun. That's all that matters. Yep. So thanks again, Mike. You know, that was definitely a, a above and beyond great interview. Uh, and other than that, subscribe, rate us five stars, you know, on. Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. Like I said, subscribe on YouTube. Go check out our Discord, our Patreon server, and check you all out next week. Take care. Ciao, ciao.